Richardson, and I'm, my co-author is Josh Williamsy, who looked at the Golden Grove and Well Range deposits. Uh, he compared those, and I, I've looked at a couple as well. And I'd like to acknowledge all the companies who donated drill core to the survey or loaned it to us for, for the purpose of this study, and also to the geologists who gave us a lot of their information and knowledge. I've put an overview here, but um, what I'll be doing is talking about Golden Grove. It's Golden Grove. And then there's Glenview, which is at Well Range. Austin Quinns over here, and you and Mary. This is a, a definition of VMS deposits, I'll just leave it to you to read them. The most important thing is that they're formed in extensional tectonic settings, and that, that includes seafloor spreading and arc environments. For many years, VMS deposits were classified according to the lithological associations that they were found in. And more recently, they've been classified according to the tectonic setting. And I've just put some examples there. For example, continental margin arcs, uh, uh, bimodal felsic associations, etc. Golden Grove has two world-class deposits. Gosson Hill and Scuttles, as well as several other prospects. <coughs> uh, I'll just um, give you more indication of the stratigraphic section in the next slide so you can see it a bit better. The, the succession includes a lot of volcanoclastic material, including pumiceous structure, like that's shown. Um, there are also Sillstones and sandstones and turf. Lava flows aren't that common except um, in the overlying scuttles formation. The main mineralisation is at the top of Golden Grove member four and Golden Grove member six, and there's also mineralisation in scuttles member three down there. This is just an example of some high-grade zinc mineralisation from Golden Grove. The last two metres assay over 30% zinc <coughs> and um, in the lower part you've got massive sphalerite here and up here um, in the lower grade you've got just eliminated stellarite within the chirp. This is a section of Gosson Hill and Scuttles showing the drill holes that Josh looked at. The one that I'll, or the one where that tray of zinc mineralisation is shown with a star, and I'll also show you high logger data from that hole. The high logger has um, can give you shortwave spectra and thermal infrared. The shortwave infrared infests the platy minerals such as chlorite and white micas, and the thermal infrared infests the uh, quartz and felspars. In the summary plots, like I've given here, the, you can see some variation, for example, in in white micas from muscovite, which is in bright yellow, to paragonite in brown, and the chlorites from magnesium iron in the blue to the chlor um, iron rich chloride in the light yellow. And um, in the thermal, um, you can see pelagic clays there, it's in dark brown. That's only present there in the late stage dolerites and um, rhyolite intrusives and also in the hanging wall day site 
that, um, as you would expect, most of the pledge place has been altered, so it's not there. So it gives you some indication of style of alteration that you could, could get. Um, the sink rich tray that I showed you is just here, shown in red, that's the mineralisation. You can use a program called the Spectral Geologist or PSG to construct scalars which show you uh, better variation in the fluorite and white mica compositions or in fact in any mineral composition. And the uh, Golden Grove, there's a tendency for the chlorides to become more iron rich in the vicinity of mineralisation and for the white micas to become more paraganitic, uh, except where you've got the later intrusion. So you can see a couple of spikes there that are muscovitic there due to the rhyolite dikes. <coughs> this is a model from Sabina Sharp's PhD thesis. She shows initially um, deposition of member four with some exhalative sulphide mineralization and then followed by a stage where there's a lot of solidification of the volcanic glass and fluorine alteration. Um, then she thinks that the, um, there was massive pyrite formed in the more porous <coughs> units of Golden Road 4. Oh, sorry, massive magnetite. And then another stage of structural reactivation with sulphides replacing the magnetite and some exhalative sulphides in the top of member six, followed by uh, the major growth of sulphides along this um, mineralizing fault. And she thinks most of the mineralization is formed by replacement. An alternative view would be that the, there were actually two stages of exhalative mineralization and that the shirts acted as like a ponding, so you do get some replacement textures in the underlying rocks. And that would be the sort of view that was put forward by Fraker and Ashley and others. This world range and the Glenview prospect is shown there. It's in a, also in a sequence of pyroclastics. You also get feldspar, uh, so get pumiceous fractures there. Very similar to a uh, golden grove and greater bedding, um, all indicative of turbidity current deposition and finer sediments. The volcanics on the northern side of the world range, which is a bit, a major bit, are about uh, 230 million years older than the volcanics on the southern side, suggesting that the BIFs um, are a, represent a, a very long period of quies, volcanic quiescence. I've just put a couple of the intersections there from, from World Range. <coughs> this is some of the mineralisation from Glenview. There's some scholar on here that's conformable with a bedding. And there's also some jasperoidal shirty brectures with mineralization just beneath that strut form mineralization. So if I look at the data from Glenview, light golden grove, chlorite and white micas are the dominant alteration minerals. And the chlorite is more iron rich in the vicinity of mineralization and white mica tends to be paraganitic. This is um, on the, well, the, the titanium, sorry, zircon titanium versus niobium yerbium plot of Winchester and Floyd. The rocks from both World Range and from Golden Grove plot in the dry dacite field. And the um, rocks from both areas plot 
in the active continental margin or continental margin arc field on the Gorium Yerbium versus Chantalum Yerbium of Chantal and Gordon. This is here in Mary. It's a very, very different deposit. <coughs> Um, the main deposit is just deserts. So I have the pointer. It's just here, and I've given the resource there. It's a long, and the long strike from that, there's Trajan and C zone. And A zone up here is possibly at the same horizon. Whereas B zone and Augustus over here are at a higher stratigraphic level. The deposits are associated with dip. Turf, and there's at least three horizons at just deserts. And I'll give you a bit more information about what the upper volcanics and lower volcanics are in the next slide. So all of the volcanics from the lower volcanics, and these in, that plot in the basalt field on this um, here sky classification diagram, <coughs> which is quite a surprising result since everyone previously has mapped them as felsic volcanics. Um, you, I've put a photo there of the least altered one, so it actually looks like a basalt there. You can actually see the remnant plagic clays. In places you get hyaloclastites and um, often it's amygdaloidal. The, Upper volcanics in the just deserts, Trajan and sea zone area, plot in the andesite or basaltic andesite field. And I've given an example there of an amygdaloidal one. In the Augustus area, you get basalts that are quite different in appearance and they're actually foliatic. And the the only place where I've ever seen anything that looks like a rhyolite is as a remnant within the gabbro intrusions. I forgot to mention those. Um, the area has been extensively intruded by gabbro and peroxenite, and the only place I've ever found rhyolite is about two metre interval within those as a remnant. This is some of the ore from you and Mary. Um, main ore mineral is chalcopyrite. But you also get gold and tellurides. <coughs> this is a scanned slide of a sulphide brexer from the sea zone. And the sulphides there are shown in dark. And there's a siliceous sort of bit like sediment fragment in here that's got beautifully folded thin magnetite laminae, and the only way I can imagine that happening would be if it was folded when it was in a soft um, gelatinous state, and I'm interpreting that it was formed by soft sediment slumping on the side of a hydrothermal vent. Main alteration minerals at you and Mary are talc. Um, there's Anthophyllite and cordierite. Distally, you get cordierite. Um, sorry, you get chlorite, which can be iron-rich or magnesium-rich, and sometimes get both in the same vein. So the blue one is iron-rich, and the green one's more magnesium-rich. One of the really surprising minerals that I found was hypersthene, and that suggests that the mineralizing fluids were really hot. Um, th this is in an uh, amygdaloidal basalt, so you've got a core still in the amygdal, and then you've got this hypersthene here. This is the um, data from the Hylogger, the uh, drill hole that went right through the middle of the just deserts deposit. Um, there are zones that are missing because they were used for metallurgy, but the surrounding rocks give you a good indication of the alteration. And Talc, as you can see, it's in pink there in, in swir and in purple in turf. Uh, this succession's been intruded by granophyre here and by um, andesite 
dikes here and where that happens you get quite different chemistry and, and you can see there's remnant or you get plate plays there where you don't get it in the other areas. This is um, some of the other some of the scalars from that same hole. Chlorite is um, not very abundant at all in the bore zone, although you do get some. White mica is absolutely absent from all of the, the core, except where you get these heavy intrusions and the granophyte. Calc, as I said, is the most abundant mineral. And you also get calcium poor amphiboles, and that includes amphipolite and coming to nine, associated with the mineralisation. On the thorium zirconium niobium plot, the, all the volcanics from the upper and lower volcanics in the Just Deserts, Trajan, and C zone area plot in the calcalkaline basalt field of woods um, in, in an arc environment, volcanic arc environment. And the basalt from Augustus plots in the island arc foliot field. And on a thorium yerbium versus niobium yerbium plot of Pierce, the chemistry suggests that these rocks form in an oceanic island arc. This is just my model of events that just deserts. First, there was extrusion of calcalkaline basalt. Then you have hydrothermal fluids depositing the mineralization and at the same time cherts and the fluids must have been extremely hot because you've got hypersthene and chloride and calcium poor amphiboles being deposited along the conduits. Then the whole lot was covered by andesite and intruded by andesitic dikes and then intruded by layered matrix intrusions. And granophyre. The granophyre runs all the way along the mineralized horizon at Ulam area. It's almost certainly stoking out some of the ore. Now, Austin Quinn's the geology, um, different geologists have very different interpretations of what's going on. But the most important thing to note is that the deposits in the northern part of the area are associated with BIV, near the contact between basalt and schist. Uh, schist has been variously regarded as, well, uh, sorry, I should say that schist has andalusite in it in the <coughs> northern area, and it was first regarded as a metamorphosed sediment by Feltman in 1922, and then later in the 1970s by um, Newmont mapped it as, as volcanics, and CRA followed that interpretation. Um, and more recently, possibly, um, there are some volcanic intrusions in there that Selleck shown on, on, in red on the top diagram. In the, the southern part, Austin is the the main ore deposit, or in fact it is the main ore deposit, but there's very little outcrop there, but it's definitely associated with felsic schists that are after rhyolites, and, and but there are other um, schists that are of indefinite origin, they could be, there's chloride schists and talc amphibol schists <coughs> that could be after mafic rocks as well, and it's also associated with beef. Oh, this is um, a silver swan interpretation of the structure at Austin, and, and it gives you the resource there too. So they have this very complex structure that runs perpendicular virtually to, to the main structure shown on those previous maps. This is some um, core from Austin. Um, the core is fairly well laminated, uh, where you get 
So there's these areas that stellarite rich core here. There are areas that are rich in talc in this area here, and other areas that are rich in amphiboles. And the amphiboles here include anthopolite and also coming tonight, the calcium four amphiboles, just like at you and Mary. And it, this is a rhyolite or a rhyolitic volcanic plastic from, from that drill hole at Austin. And this is the high logger data for Austin. The mineralization is shown in red. Um, talc is in pink up the top, um, and amphiboles, or hornblende's green, kind of like in that sort of tanny color. The mineralization is associated with talc and amphiboles. What the amphiboles hit, um, that are shown are calcic rich, but you, there's also calcium poor amphiboles that I, I can bring up on the scale. Most people have interpreted the two mineralized horizons at Austin to be the same one that's been repeated by folding or faulting. But there are some differences between them, and the, the lower horizon is in, very enriched in calcium four amphiboles and topolite and coming tonight, whereas the upper one has none. And the upper horizon is has um, magnesium rich fluoride, whereas the lower one has mixed chloride composition, but generally more iron rich. There's no mitres associated with the mineralization, but further away you do get paragonetic mica. I've put Silver Swan's interpretation for Quinn's and here. Um, you'll notice they've got in dark blue, an advanced, or in light blue, sorry, an advanced argillite alteration envelope. And I assume that's because of the andalusite in the schist in that area. The rhyolites plot, oh, sorry, the, the volcanics plot in the rhyolite field, as you could expect. And there are also intrusive dolerites. And I, I think there are actually andesites, but I think the ones that Kerich looked at here are actually dolerites. I don't think any of the basalts are actually analysed by him. That Kerich interpreted the geochemistry to be indicative of a rifted art setting, most likely a continental back art. Oh, okay, thank you. Now, in the EIS report, Silver Swan Group noted that there was silimonite in the B pole ATD 101, um, particularly in this bit here, in this interval bit. But um, when I looked at it, it's actually anthopolite. So I think that instead of having aluminium metasomatism, you've actually got magnesium metasomatism at Austin anyway. I didn't see any aluminium rich minerals at Austin. But there are some, obviously, there are at Quinn's. <coughs> This is a comparative summary of all of those deposits. I've put in bold the features that are common to all of them. And the first one is that there are bits associated with all of those. And that suggests that there's a period of volcanic quiescence associated with them all. And that also that they form in a subaqueous environment. The other host rocks vary from bryolite to basalt. The ages are quite different, but um, Golden Grove and Glenview are roughly similar, but Glenview is a little bit older. Austin is much, much younger. And you and Mary, we don't 
really know, but it's certainly older than 2813, which is the date of the Gulbaru tonal light that intrudes the succession. It's possibly the same age as Quinn's. Elements that are added in all of them are base metals, iron, magnesium, and sulfur. But different deposits have different other things. So you and Mary and Quinn's both have telluride associated with it. So you've got tellurium introduced and there's bismuth introduced and Golden Grove's got tin, which isn't a you and Mary and Quinn's. The main alteration minerals at Golden Grove and Glenview are fluorite and white mica, whereas at Austin and Quinton's and you and Mary, it's calc and amphiboles. Fluorite is ubiquitous everywhere. It forms an old pistol alteration product. And white mica is associated with most of them, but not, not at you and Mary. Tectonic settings, if you um, believe the chemistry, then Golden Grove and Glenview formed in a continental margin arc, Austin in, and Quinns in a continental back arc rib, and you and Mary in an oceanic arc rib. Um, I'll just leave you with my conclusions here. But, um, I, I would like to emphasise that you don't need to look for felsic volcanics, you can also look in basalts, they're calcalkaline basalts, and there's evidence of a, a rift environment in particular. Thank you. We've got a couple of minutes. Has uh, anyone got a question? I see John has got a question. I guess it's a bit of a, a, a comment in the interest of the overall theme of mineral systems. It's very interesting to see that you're picking two ages of, of mineralisation in the Murchison, and particularly the, the 2.9, I guess, people are sort of focused on. But I think the 2.81 is interesting because I think that's also emerging as an important time for nickel sulphides. Uh, you know, some of the recent work also from the GSWA, I think, is sort of implicating more a 2.8 age for the, the Southern Cross <coughs> province. Mardiite deposits, but it also looks like the best age for uh, Windara and the deposits that, are, that form along the, the eastern margin. So I think there's, there's a bigger picture context there. Yeah, well, there, there well could be. Uh, there is there, like Bononites, for example, being found. So there's a lot of argument about whether there were arcs or not, but certainly it would suggest that there were. You know, there was some disruption at that time, so could have a lot of things going on at that, at that period. Right, I'll bring the microphone up the back here for Peter. John. John. Uh, Lee, what, one thing I sort of, uh, an observation, I, and you may be able to talk on the significance or not, but again, coming back to kind of the mineral systems, is really, is there any significance or role played by the layered matrix intrusions in those um, deposits that, that sit in the Southern Cross Province and on that eastern edge of the Murchison. Because certainly if you look at the, the distribution of the um, VMS deposits, um, and we see those two age distributions, but I think it's quite startling that the, the eastern edge of the, um, Murch of the Murchison Province that faces out into the large layered matrix um, intrusion with Amar and so on, is a series of these little shows of um, VMS deposits and so on. And again, then when you have a look on that western side of the Southern Cross province, um, not only at you and Mary, but also up through Barambi is another great example where there seems to be this really close association between the layered matrix bodies and these um, uh, VMS type occurrences. Okay. Well, the VMS deposits are later. Oh, so, sorry, the Layered mafic intrusions are later than the VMS deposits. They intrude them. So they're not directly related, but they could have been related to the, the magma chamber. It could be a long-lived mineral system. And so they could be 
with part of the same mineral system. And there could be some flue there that's, or a hot spot that's sort of keeping this system going for a long time. And it may be responsible for the layered matrix intrusions, but they're definitely later. Great, thanks, uh, Lee. Can everyone stop? Uh, thank you.